Hello, everyone. This is the 58th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we continue our interview series with Mr. Roberto Brambilla as we discuss the matches of the West Germany national team for the 1981-82 season. Mr. Brambilla is an Italian freelance journalist and a contributor to Italian newspaper Avenir. He is also the author of Italian language book on East German football titled Gera una volta l'est, Storia di calcio della Germania orientale e contropiede. Welcome back, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, hi, Paul. Nice to have you back on. We left off last time in the summer of 1981 with West Germany seemingly as the strongest nation in Europe. By now, the veteran Paul Breitner had been reintegrated into the national team and the double act of Rummenigge and Breitner was the talk of all of Europe. The World Cup qualifiers had been a formality as the West Germans had won all their matches and in fact would go on to win every one of their qualifiers. This season would culminate with the World Cup in Spain and the West Germans were confident in their chances given their form. The season starts on September 2nd with a friendly at Chorzo against Poland. And we must remind ourselves that this was perhaps the last great Poland side with the likes of Zbigniew Boniek, Joseph Mlinarczyk, Marek Zuba, Vladislav Zmuda, among, and Smolarek, among others. For this match on September 2nd, West German manager Jupp Derval selected the following squad. Harald Schumacher of Köln in goal. Manfred Kaltz of Hamburg, he replaced by Wolfgang Dremler of Bayern Munich in 86 minute. Wilfred Hannes of Borussia Mönchengladbach. Bernd Forster of Stuttgart. Hans-Peter Brigel of Kaiserslautern. He'd be replaced by international debutant Holger Hieronymus of Hamburg in the 81st minute. Then you have Felix Magath of Hamburg, Paul Breitner of Bayern Munich, Hans Müller of Stuttgart, Ronald Borchers of Eintracht Frankfurt, Klaus Fischer of Köln. Uh, he had drawn Köln that season from relegated Schalke. And the new captain of the West German national team, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge of Bayern Munich. The Germans wearing green would win this match 2-0. Klaus Fischer scored in the 60th minute and Rummenigge scored in the 71st minute. This was a comfortable win for the Germans against a very good Poland side to kickstart the season. Remembering, as uh, you say, that it's the that's the season will lead to the World Cup, and Jupp Durval has, in many cases, already done the starting lineup. They have a clear idea of uh, who was playing, who was not playing. Remember that, as you uh, remember before, uh, Paul Breitner came back after some seasons where they have a clash with uh, the FAB, the German Federation executives and uh, also with the with the coach here we see a solid team with many players like Brigel, Forster, uh, Kalt who played in the most important sites in Europe and uh, we have uh, in that moment Carlites Rummenigge was uh, 26 he was maybe in one of the best moments of his career and uh, remember that it was uh, considered the who comes after uh, Gerd Müller Remember that Gerd Müller retired after the winning World Cup in Germany, in West Germany, in 1974. Uh, you, you said it was a comfortable win, but we remember that uh, a comfortable win against uh, a team that one year later will be third at World Cup. And remembering that in that moment, Poland was not living a good moment. Remember that uh, just one year before, and also in that year, we have a huge tension. It was also something remembering that West Germany was one of the most important allies of the United States. 
during Cold War. And that match was also a way of uh, showing how football and everything in Poland was going as usual. But remember that uh, that was maybe in the last year, except the South American tour, maybe one of the most important tests uh, toward the World Cup. Because uh, we saw also the last time the qualifying group was quite easy, except Austria, where they have comfortable teams, and uh, Germany, as you remember before, make eight matches. Eight. When, and then I forgot we have Klaus Fischer, maybe one of the underrated striker in German history. Not for easy, because it was between Kalle Rummenigge and Gerd Müller. And when you play contemporary with this two one, maybe you should say that is forgotten. But remember that he's one of the most prolific strikers in the Bundesliga history. A few weeks later, on September 23rd, West Germany played their first World Cup qualifier of the season. They hosted Finland at Bochum. For this match, we have the following lineup for West Germany. Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Uli Stilicke of Real Madrid in Spain, Bern Forster, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magath, Ronald Borchers, captain of the side Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, and Klaus Fischer of Kohl. This would be a one-sided, almost a practice session for the Germans. They would win 7-1. You have Fischer scoring in the 11th minute. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge would score a hat-trick in the 42nd, 60th, and the 72nd minute. Paul Breitner would score a double in the 54th and 67th minute. And their Bayern teammate, Wolfgang Dremler, would score in the 83rd minute. Actually, Finland had briefly tied the match with Hanu Turunen scoring in the 41st minute. But it was a very comfortable West German win. Expect a Germany win. At this point, the Germans were on fire internationally. If you want to mark, Shan, we say that six or seven goals of the West German national team was scored by Bayern Munich players. That's, yes. that's something that you say that in that moment, you can say that Bayern Munich was not living one of the his best moments in, in history. But they have players like Karl-Heinz Rummenigge that here he scored an trick and uh, Paul Breitner. Remember that Paul Breitner is one of, uh, holds one of the uh, most important records in uh, German football history. He's the only German player who scored two goals in two World Cup, World Cup finals. Final. Yes. yes, one in 1974 and then at the end against Italy in the World Cup and Spain. We can say that when you notice that the team is the same as the previous match, maybe we have only more Uli Stilike who played for Real Madrid and one is one of the most powerful liberals at that moment. He was considered one of the five most important Liberals in the history of German football. Remember against, uh, say, Lothar Matthäus, but also uh, after Franz Beckenbauer. Remember that uh, now we consider the football like uh, is like a bit leveled on the top. Remember that at that moment, Finnish football players were amateurs and uh, uh, the, the level was quite different. And uh, remember that at that moment, we have uh, so few players, uh, Finnish players in uh, European top leagues. Maybe no one, for example, in Italy, the first one was at the middle of, uh, I think, at, at the end of the 80s. And for example, we have Swedish, in Germany we have Swedish, we have uh, uh, Norwegian, but we have no Finnish. Remember that uh, because of that comfortable wins, a large win, were also due to the level of the opponents. But as you say, they were quite ready for the World Cup to prepare this episode. I read some newspapers, some website about the that this season they were quite convinced not to win, maybe not to win, but to play against the most important teams and try to go until the end. 
Their next qualifier would be a sterner test against their closest rivals and neighbors, Austria. On October 14th at Vienna, Austria hosted the West Germans. This match would mark the international debut of Pierre Litbarski of Köln. Jupp Derval had an injury crisis as Borchers, Hansi Müller, and Hrubesch were all out injured. And maybe that's the reason why Litbarski started in this match. But for this match, Derval selected the following squad. Harald Schumacher of Köln, Manfred Kaltz, Uli Stilicke, Karl-Heinz Forster of Stuttgart, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magath, making his international debut, Pierre Litbarski of Köln, captain of the side, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, and Klaus Fischer. And quickly going through the Austrian lineup managed by Karl Stotz, you have Friedrich Concilia of austria Vienna. Johan Dihanich of Austria Vienne, Heribert Weber of Rapid Vienne, the late Bruno Petzai of Eintracht Frankfurt in West Germany, Dieter Mirneg of Como in Italy, Roland Hattenberger of Wacker Innsbruck, Herbert Prohaska of Inter in Italy, Kurt Yara of Grasshopper Zurich in Switzerland, Reinhold Hintermeyer of Nuremberg in West Germany. He'd be replaced by Maximilian Hagmeyer of West Linz in the 71st minute. Walter Schachner of Cesena in Italy. And captain of the side, Johann Krankel of Rapid Vienna. For this match, the Austrians would take the lead in the 50th minute after a breakaway through Walter Schachner. But just two minutes later, the debutant Pierre Litbarski would tie the match. A few minutes later, in the 20th minute, Felix Magath would give the West Germans the lead. In the 78th minute, Pierre Litbarski, who was making his international debut, scored his second goal to have a dream debut for West Germany and give the West Germans a 3-1 win against their closest rivals in the group. And again, we have to mention at this point Austria were quite a decent side. They had qualified for the 1978 World Cup and they would go on and qualify for the 1982 World Cup. Perhaps for them also, this was probably their last great team for some time now with the likes of Krankel and Prohaska and Schachner. Uh, we have the, yeah, we have some players who played in Syria and then we have some players really who played at the top European clubs. Maybe I agree with you is maybe the most, maybe as talented player, maybe uh, one of the best in the post-war. Maybe the team of uh, World Cup in Switzerland in 1954, maybe we have the same level. But yeah, we have some players who played well and at top level in Europe. And remember, and we, uh, we talk about it later, uh, they were also opponents during uh, the World Cup. And remember that this match is as is a derby, not only because of two German-speaking countries, also because three years uh, before in Argentina, in uh, Cordoba, they for maybe one of the most important win for an uh, Austrian national team in the post-war, and they considered like for uh, as Italian, we uh, considered Italy against Germany in 1907 at Azteca, maybe one of the most important because. Remember that uh, in that moment in Argentina, the uh, German uh, national side was the World Cup title holder. And right. uh, there was the last match of Helmut Schoen, because after that match, uh, he was sacked, or maybe he left uh, the match. And remember, we, we, you mentioned the debut of uh, Pierre of, uh, Lekbaski. Lekbaski is one, uh, another underrated player because we consider that maybe he's one of the most brilliant talent, pure talent of the history of German football because he's a really not German player. He seems like a South American. He has a fine technique. He could play really as an attacking midfielder or like a winger. And in the following years, he was decisive because 
its lineup was quite fixed with a fixed role. It sometimes we could change the match, not with the power like Lothar Mateus, but it was a really, really a not German player. When we consider German player, we consider like a Reins Rummenigge, talented, but uh, also powerful. It seems when we play, it's uh, really like a Italian, uh, like a Argentinian. Sometimes they make the comparison, but I'm, I not agree because Bruno Conti is really, really better. But uh, Pierlet Baschi, like a winger, a world-class player. And he was underrated because in that team, uh, he seems uh, not a normal player, but uh, one of the other ta- talents in the team. Next, we come to the month of November, where West Germany has two World Cup qualifiers in the space of four days. On November 18th, West Germany is hosting Albania at Dortmund. For this match, Jurgen Milewski of Hamburg would make his debut as a substitute. But going into the lineup, for this match, Harald Schumacher did not start in goal. So we have Eich Imel of Borussia Dortmund starting. We have Manfred Kaltz. He'd be replaced by Lothar Matthäus of Borussia Mönchengladbach in the 66th minute. Uli Stilicke, Karl-Heinz Forster, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magath, Pierre Litbarski, captain of the side Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, and he'd be replaced by Hamburg's international debutant Jürgen Milewski in the 50th minute after he had already scored a hat-trick in the match and Klaus Fischer of Köln. Again, this would be yet another easy win for West Germany, 8-0. Again, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge scored a hat-trick in the 5th, 19th, and the 43rd minute. Klaus Fischer scored twice in the 32nd and 72nd minute. Manfred Kalt scored in the 36th minute, Pierre Litbarski in the 52nd minute, and Paul Breitner scored a penalty kick in the 67th minute. I remember that that match was played, I think, I read at Rote Erde. It's not uh, the old uh, stadium, uh, Bruce Dortmund Stadium, where now played the rest of the team. Is, uh, if you go to Dortmund, yeah, we have the West, the West Fallen Stadium and near we have the Rote Erde. It's interesting because we see, again, your Ostrubesh, one of the key players. Remember that Ostrubesh, maybe we can consider it a great striker, but also as many, because he was not so skilled as technique, we not consider it important, but... He, for example, we saw together, they, they said he scored in a final, in a European final in 1980 in Rome. And uh, we have a really a great player. And also with, uh, is interesting because uh, we have Frank Mill. Frank Mill is one of the, maybe, I don't know, is uh, one of the most important uh, players in the 80s of uh, Borussia Dortmund. Remember that we see Borussia Dortmund like a, one of the top European teams, but in that moment, they fight for relegation. What is interesting that we not mentioned before, in Wien, they gain the pass to go to Spain. These two matches, this one against the following against Bulgaria, were useless. But uh, in that matches, Yubdova tried to make the last uh, call up to think who could go to Spain with them. We say that also Frank Miller is interesting. And also that uh, in that moment, uh, I read some German newspapers, then Frank Mill and Rossmann was, was his uh, teammate, was booed by fans. Is there something interesting? Because normally in West Germany, football matches, no one was booed um, because it was also nowadays. It's quite difficult to hear boos to own players, also for away players. It's not in their football culture. Four days later, on November 2nd, West Germany rounded out their World Cup qualifiers at Dusseldorf, hosting Bulgaria. For this match, we have the following squad. Harald Schumacher, Wilfred Hannes, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Hans-Peter Briegel, 
Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magath, and he be replaced by Klaus Alofs of Köln in the 63rd minute. He had been out of the national team for some time, I guess through injury. Captain of the side, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, Klaus Fischer, and Horst Hubesch of Hamburg. Again, this would be a comfortable win for the Germans, 4-0. Klaus Fischer scored in the fourth minute. Karl Sainz Rummenigge scored in the 49th minute. And in the 82nd minute, he would score from an indirect free kick. And Manfred Karl scored with a penalty kick in the 63rd minute. So this was West Germany's eighth win of the qualifiers. They ended an excellent year. And Karl-Heinz Rummenigge would win the Ballon d'Or for the second year running. In fact, Paul Breitner would finish second. And another player who would cause a lot of headache for West Germany this season, Bernd Schuster of Barcelona finished third. We somewhat mentioned it in our last podcast, but Bernd Schuster had a lot of problems. He complained about the influence of Breitner and Rummenigge in running of the team and called Derval, basically called that he was completely powerless against those two. As a result, Derval wanted to have nothing to do with Schuster and the national team. The, and each other. Yes. And the, I, I, think that, I think that for many years, they didn't talk uh, one, because remember that in that moment, Bernd Schuster was uh, one of uh, maybe in the top 10 European midfielders. And uh, the problem is Bernd Schuster, as we say also in the last uh, episode we say that have every problem with any kind of authority and uh, especially with uh, because remember that in that moment German football was really really uh, something uh, really conservative also as attitude as kind of uh, relationship between manager and players I remember that uh, sometimes say that when Helmut Schoen in the camps came in the dressing room uh, during the workup. Every player had to stand to wait in silence what the manager says. It's something that we can say, okay, it could be normal. But remember that they are professionals like Beckenbauer, like Schuster. And remember that the problem was one, this, that problem of really relationship uh, between them and uh, the idea that Bernard Schuster has a strong personality. And remember that Nader, Breitner, and Rummenigge like them a lot. Not as a player, eh? as a team leader. And I read that the problem that really he didn't want to be one of the players, but he could be the, the most important player of the team. And remember that even Rummenigge and Paul Breitner as, the, as a really, really huge personality. And also they are re- more experienced. Remember that Paul Breitner won a World Cup when Barry Schuster was a young guy. Remember that that was the problem. And maybe we don't know how could be how could have been the German team with Barry Schuster at World Cup because he was a really a brilliant player, underrated because of this character, of this attitude and personality. Probably easier to leave him out as well because it was a winning team. If the team had been struggling, there might have been more pressure to pick him. But while the team was winning and obviously such a strong team, there probably wasn't that demand for him to be in the team. It was easier to leave him out, maybe. Remember that in Italy, we have the same problem. Remember that for many years, we have some talented player who played like backup. Uh, remember that uh, Roberto Mancini, he played maybe, I don't know how many minutes in the World Cup because uh, he was a strong personality. We have uh, Italy had a huge, great team and uh, it was not unnecessary, but it was not so important. When you have a huge amount of talent, maybe I remember that in the following decade, maybe Mancini would play every time, but it's the same 
because sometimes when we have to make the team building, you know that a player could disturb what you say, what you do with the other players, and we say, okay, we are out. And for Germany, it was quite uh, common because uh, they have this kind of attitude. If you don't follow the rules, if you if you if you can say that in uh, the 90s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, we have no extraordinary players. We can, in Germany, could not play George Best because uh, it's quite out, out every kind of rule. And really, and uh, for example, I don't know I was in England, but uh, for example, they are so strict, for example, about the attitude also outside. We have some players in the 50 and the 60, they have some problem with alcohol. But uh, they were excluded sometimes. But remember that uh, that's that's really an, a different a different culture. But uh, I agree, Paul. I agree with you. That's the problem. That it was a, three, a winning team. They win and they say, "Okay, how can we create problem from uh, uh, ourselves?" And uh, that's the problem. And also because uh, Manchester was not so easy to manage. Also, as a manager, when we was manager, for example, Real Madrid, it was not so easy because. He said what he thinks. And that's a problem that sometimes was not the, the best uh, also in that uh, period and in that moment. But the DFB president, Herman Neuberger, he tried to act as a mediator to reintegrate Schuster back into the national team. In any case, Schuster was injured in a league match versus Athletic Bilbao in December of 1981, and he would miss the rest of the season. So that problem was solved in a way. But uh, again, it's always a mystery how his inclusion would have helped West Germany in subsequent World Cups as well. Now we come to the new year, 1982. And West Germany has many friendlies and the tour of South America lined up in preparations for the World Cup. Their first friendly is on February 17th, 1982 at Hanover. They're hosting Portugal. For this match, we have Harold Schumacher. He'd be replaced by Bernd Frank of Eintracht Braunschweig in the 46th minute, Manfred Kaltz, Bernd Forster, Karl Heinz Forster, Hans Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Captain Karl Heinz Rummenigge, Horst Trubesch, he replaced by Lothar Matthäus in the 46th minute, Klaus Fischer, Pierre Litbarski, and he replaced by Karl Altgover of Stuttgart in the 72nd minute. And quickly going through the Portugal lineup, you have Manuel Bento of Benfica, Gabriel Mendes of Porto, captain of the side Humberto Coelho of Benfica, Yuriko of Sporting, Pietra of Benfica, he replaced by Carlos Xavier of Sporting in the 64th minute, Eliseu of Boavista, Dito of Braga, he replaced by Bastos Lopez of Benfica in the 46th minute. Romeo of Porto. He replaced by Abru of Vitoro Guimaraes in the 75th minute. Antonio Oliveira of Sporting. Norton de Matos of Portimonense. Rui Jordao of Sporting. He be replaced by Nene of Benfica in the 46th minute. And the side managed by Juca. This would be a 3-1 West Germany win. Klaus Fischer scored in the 24th minute. Humberto Quelho scored an own goal in the 27th minute, deflecting Grubesh's cross into his own net. Portugal would pull a goal back in the 44th minute by Norton de Matos, but Klaus Fischer would score his second goal in the 51st minute to give West Germany a 3-1 win. Then we come to the month of March where West Germany embarks on a tour of South America to play friendlies against Brazil and Argentina. For this tour, Derval would have to do without Rummenigge, who was injured 
in the last minute and had to miss this tour. And other players missing included Felix Magat, Wilfred Hannes, and Carl Algover. For the first match of this tour would be on March 21st at uh, Rio's Maracana Stadium against Brazil. Brazil themselves were missing a few players like the captain Socrates and Cerezo and the likes of Reinaldo, Serginho, Zé Sergio, Edevaldo and Batista, not to mention overseas players like Falcao and Dircio. So as a result, you had a number of players making their debuts for Brazil, and that included Careca, future star of Brazil and Napoli in Italy. And another interesting aspect of this match was that the original referee was supposed to be the Portuguese Antonio Garrido. However, the Germans protested the fact that he spoke the same language as their opponents. So he was replaced with the Spaniard Augusto Lamo Castillo. This was also Lothar Mateus's 21st birthday. And his task was to mark Zico out of the game, who was captaining Brazil in Socrates' absence. The German lineup was such. Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, captaining the side in Rummenigge's absence, Uli Stilicke, Karl-Heinz Forster, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Lothar Matthäus, Pierre Litbarski, He'd be replaced by international debutant Frank Meal of Borussia Mönchengladbach in the 85th minute. Klaus Fischer, he'd be injured in the 13th minute and would be out of the tour through injury. So he was replaced by Horst Trubesch in the 13th minute. Hansi Müller, who'd be replaced by another international debutant, Stefan Engels of Köln in the 81st minute. For Brazil, managed by Tele Santana, you have Valdir Perez of Sao Paulo, Leandro of Flamingo, Oscar of Sao Paulo, Luizinho of Atletico Mineiro, Junior of Flamingo, Vitor of Flamingo, Adilio of Flamingo, Zico, captain of the side from Flamingo, Paulo Isidoro of Gremio, Careca of Garani, Mario Sergio of Sao Paulo, and he replaced by Eder of Atletico Mineiro in the 70th minute, side managed by Tele Santana. Brazil would win the match 1-0. Junior would score the winner in the 83rd minute. Lothar Mateus did well to mark Zico out of the match. But the Germans were otherwise cautious and defensive, with Stilicke standing out for the Germans. Fischer was injured and out of the tour, which gave an opportunity to Hrubesh to make a final push to make the squad as a starter. That's the for uh, West Germany. The tour was organized to test their skills against uh, the. World Cup title holder because Argentina won the World Cup and Brazil. We did, we say that that was the start, Brazilian starting lineup. But you also mentioned how many players didn't play. One uh, soccer test. They have, that's maybe they consider after Brazil in uh, Mexico in 1960 maybe one of the most important most uh, powerful teams in uh, Brazil history. As you said, Germany didn't play bad, but they failed to score. It's interesting that Mateus show his personality, his way to mark Zico. Maybe Zico is considered uh, after Pelé and Garincha and maybe Ronaldo, the most talented player in the history of Brazilian football. And I would say that's interesting that in that moment, if you make a comparison with every other lineup, during this year, uh, we say that the defense is always the same. Breitner, Reagan, Forster, Kaltz, Schilke. It's the same. 
because and it, it will be the same also in the World Cup. It's interesting that uh, Lotte Mateus in the 1982, I think they he didn't play or play so few in the uh, in the World Cup. But we say that we have player like Anzi Müller, uh, with another so strange player for German football. He seems uh, an, an Italian player or a Spanish player uh, because of the skills. But and then we say that uh, Rubesh, uh, after the um, injury of Klaus Fischer, played and uh, will be also one of the players in the World Cup. So one of the most interesting thing that uh, that match is the the match with the most attendance with a German team playing, because I think that the Maracana was full and one of the matches where we have more than 100,000 people in the stadium. But we say that it's important because Germany, with that test, say that could be play, could be face without, not without problem, but can co- challenge the South American team uh, who could be the, their opponents in the World Cup. Three days later, on March 24th, they faced Argentina at Buenos Aires at El Monumental. For this match, you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, again, capping the side again, Uli Stilicke, Karl-Heinz Forster, Hans-Peter Brigel, Wolfgang Dremler, Lothar Mateus, who this time had to mark Diego Maradona. Paul Breitner, he'd be replaced by Bernd Forster in the 68th minute. Hansi Müller, Pierre Litbarski, he'd be replaced by Frank Mill in the 68th minute. And Horst Trubesch, and he'd be replaced by Stefan Engels in the 78th minute. Now, going through the Argentina lineup managed by Cesar Luis Menotti, the defending World Cup champions, you have Hector Ballet of Taleres. And we have to mention that he was starting because Ubaldo Filol had food poisoning. In fact, initially, there was fear that he may have contracted hepatitis. So the entire team was medically checked the morning of the match. But in any case, Hector Ballet replaced Filol. And the rest of the lineup, you have Jorge Olguin of Independiente, Luis Galvan of Talares de Cordoba, captaining the side Daniel Passarella of River Plate, Alberto Tarantini of River Plate, Juan Barbas of Racing Club. He started due to Osvaldo Ardiles' absence. Americo Gallego of River Plate, Diego Maradona of Boca Juniors, Gabriel Calderon of Independiente, Ramon Diaz of River Plate, Mario Kempes of River Plate. He will be replaced by Patricio Hernandez of Estudiantes de la Plata in the 78th minute. For this match, West Germany took the lead in the 33rd minute through Wolfgang Dremler. Argentina would tie the match in the 67th minute through Gabriel Calderon. Once again, Lothar Mateus had a very good match and Maradona was marked out of the game by Mateus. And Kempes also had a disappointing match for Argentina. They started better, but faded as the match progressed and Germans fought well. And it is said that Lothar Mateus cemented his World Cup spot with his displays on this tour. But Rubesh did not take the opportunity that was offered to him, uh, given Fisher's injury. Him and Fisher were still competing for the striker position. Rumenigue's absence was sorely felt. Nevertheless, the West Germans were confident after this tour that they had held their own against the South American giants away from home. Yeah, they are very confident because they say that in these two matches, they didn't win, but they are able to challenge them. Remember that uh, Argentinian football team is another one of the best of the world, and not because they had Maradona, but they had Campes, but they had also Passarella, and they have players like Gallego, 
also uh, Fial, but he didn't play, but it was one of the key players. Uh, that's interesting that uh, also in the previous year, they make the Mundialito. They make the Mundialito in Uruguay. And they are able to face them. And maybe what was, it was also a clash between football schools. We say that the German football team was a really German team. We say solid in defense, quite talented in the midfield. And now we have the rising star was uh, Mateus. But due to the situation, they rise some years after. Because uh, remember that in the World Cup, it was not one of the main characters because uh, they have other players. But uh, it's interesting that uh, the first backup of uh, Karin Rummenigge was uh, Osrubesh, who was at the end of his career. Maybe uh, I think that he retired uh, one or two years after winning the championship. And it's interesting that German, like nowadays, uh, they didn't produce a good striker. But a few years uh, will come uh, Jürgen Klinsmann and they solved the problem. But for some years, they have Rubesh, they have Rummenigge, and then we, they have uh, Klinsmann. But without Rummenigge, they have a scoring problem. Because uh, it was a quite solid team where they had Litbaski, we had Ansi Miller, but they are not goal scorers, pure goal scorers. They are asses men more than goal scorers. Mateus uh, was a midfielder, was able free kicks, was able to, to play also more offensive, but it was uh, maybe uh, Mateus was good to play in every role of the uh, midfield and uh, also in the old, old roles of the defense. Maybe not a wing, but uh, it could play uh, quite well. It's interesting because after that team, uh, if you read the German newspapers, they were quite convinced that they could play at the same level of that giants, as you said before. Following the tour, the following month, they have another friendly on April 14th at Köln versus Czechoslovakia. For this match, you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz. He'll be replaced by Stefan Engels in the 70th minute. Wilfred Hannes, Karl-Heinz Forster, Hans-Peter Brigel, Wolfgang Dremler. He'll be replaced by Bern Forster in the 78th minute. Paul Breitner, Lothar Matthäus, captain of the side, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. Klaus Fischer, he'll be replaced by Frank Mill in the 46th minute and Pierre Litbarski. For this match, Pierre Litbarski gave West Germany the lead in the 22nd minute. Premzil Bikovski would tie the match in the 69th minute. But just before the end, in the 88th minute, West Germany were awarded a penalty kick and Paul Breitner would score the winner. And again, this was a decent Czechoslovakia side who had also qualified for the World Cup that contained the likes of Zdenek Nehoda, Ladislav Vizek, among others, managed by Joseph Venglos. So we're nearing the end of the season. We have another friendly on May 12th at Oslo versus Norway. For this match, we have Bern Frank in goal. He replaced by Aika Emil in the 46th minute. Derval preferring to give a run out to the substitute goalkeepers. Bern Forster, he replaced by Wilfred Hannes in the 46th minute. Uli Stilike, Karl Heinz Forster, Hans Peter Briegel, he replaced by Holger Hieronymus in the 46th minute. Lothar Matthäus, Paul Breitner. He'd be replaced by international debutant Uwe Reinders of Werder Bremen in the 62nd minute. Felix Magat, captain of the side Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. Horst Trubesch. He'd be replaced by Klaus Fischer in the 46th minute. And Pierre Litbarski of Köln. Again, this would be another comfortable West Germany win away from home. Karl Heinz Rummenigge would score in the fifth and the 84th minute. Arne Larsen Oakland 
who was playing at Bayer Leverkusen in West Germany, would pull a goal back in the 17th minute. Pierre Litvarski would score twice in the 34th and the 43rd minute. Roger Albertsen would pull one goal back in the 80th minute to give West Germany a 4-2 win. We come to the very last unofficial friendly of the season prior to the World Cup. On June 1st for Franz Beckenbauer's farewell match, SV Hamburg is facing off against West Germany. Hamburg, we have to mention there were West German champions that season and UEFA Cup finalists. West Germany, we have for this final friendly of the season before the World Cup, we have Harald Schumacher, Wilfried Hannes, he'd be replaced by Stefan Engels in the 46th minute, Lothar Matthäus, he'd be replaced by Uwe Reinders in the 46th minute, Karl-Heinz Forster, Bernd Forster, Uli Stilicke, Paul Breitner, He'd be replaced by Thomas Alofs of Kaiserslautern, brother of Klaus Alofs in the 65th minute. Hansi Müller, Hans-Peter Briegel, captain of the side, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. He'd be replaced by Klaus Fischer in the 70th minute and Pierre Litvarski. Quickly going through the Hamburg lineup managed by Austrian Ernest Happel, you have Uli Stein, Manfred Kaltz, Holger Hieronymus, Dietmar Jakobs, Bernd Wehmeyer, Jürgen Groh, Franz Beckenbauer, Kaspar Memmering. He'd be replaced by Thomas Van Heesen in the 46th minute. Felix Magath, Horst Trubesch, and Lars Bostrup. For this match, West Germany would win 4-2. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge would score in the 13th minute. Hansi Müller in the 23rd. Franz Beckenbauer would score an own goal in the 47th minute. And Paul Breitner would score in the 65th minute. Hamburg would pull two goals back towards the end. Lars Bostrup scored in the 78th minute. And Franz Beckenbauer himself scored with a beautiful volley in the 82nd minute. So West Germany won the Franz Beckenbauer farewell match for two. It was also around this time that Paul Breitner shaved his trademark beard for an advertisement for a fragrance. And that made a lot of headlines just before the World Cup when he did that. And I believe it was around this match, just before or after, I don't recall. I remember that. And in that moment, it was quite... Not, it's not so frequent that a player make advertisement. I remember that in these moments, we have some players we meet. So, of course, the most famous. But remember that Breitner is uh, so important also outside the field. Remember, it's an icon. Sometimes his figure was uh, misunderstood. But remember that Paul Breitner has two great skills. First one, the public relations. And the other one is football. Maybe one of the... Because anyone remembers him like the Afro, the uh, Maoist, but no one remembers that. I don't know how many players who could play in two roles like the left wing or the midfielder with the same, same ability, with the same skills. And of course, when Paul Breitner made something, it was, uh, of course, uh, on the newspapers because uh, it was a really iconic for German football in that moment because as I said before it was so different from the normal German players very different also from Beckenbauer remember they were teammates but they were not friends because they are so so different and uh, for culture for ideas maybe if you remember that one of the most important friends of Paul Bratner is Uli Ernest maybe one the opposite but to remember that it's interesting that the Sundays before the World Cup, uh, he makes an advertise, he made an advertisement, and they remember that. And we talk about it now. The German debut uh, was horrific. Maybe uh, it was oh was a, not horror because uh, the, the opposite team played well and was a, ta- a really talented team. But 
maybe I think is one of the no, I don't remember it's the only one time that Germany lost at his debut in in a World Cup. But uh, maybe maybe until then it could be that moment could be really the first time. We come to the 1982 World Cup. Joop Derval selects the following 22 players for his final team. Number one, Harald Schumacher of Köln. Number two, Hans-Peter Briegel of Kaiserslautern. Number three, Paul Breitner of Bayern Munich. Number four, Karl-Heinz Forster of Stuttgart. Number five, Bernd Forster of Stuttgart. Number six, Wolfgang Dremler of Bayern Munich. Number seven, Pierre Litbarski of Köln. Number eight, Klaus Fischer of Köln. Number nine, Horst Trubesch of Hamburg. Number 10, Hansi Müller of Stuttgart. Number 11, captain of the side, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge of Bayern Munich. Number 12, Wilfred Hannes. Number 13, Uwe Reinders of Werder Bremen. Number 14, we have Felix Magath of Hamburg. Number 15, Uli Stilicke of Real Madrid in Spain. Number 16, Thomas Alofs of Fortuna Dusseldorf. Number 17, Stefan Engels of Köln. Number 18, Lothar Matthäus of Borussia Mönchengladbach. Number 19, Holger Hieronymus of Hamburg. Number 20, Manfred Kaltz of Hamburg. Number 21, Bern Frank of Eintracht Braunschweig. And number 22, Eike Emil of Borussia Dortmund. Before embarking to Spain, Jupp Derval made the following odd move. He actually took only 19 players with him. He left Holger Hieronymus, Stefan Engels, and Thomas Alofs to remain as standby in West Germany. When he was asked about it, he said that why should he take three players who will know, will not see any action, and will just be bored staying around the hotel? Is Something that- impossible to think now that we, see, we think that we have 26 players for international tournaments. Maybe you remember that even the number of substitutes does remember that the turnover like idea was in football uh, was in football made by uh, Rigosaki uh, because that he had a huge squad. They have remember that in AC Milan at the beginning of the 90s, the first replacement of uh, Marco Van Basten was a Ballon d'Or like uh, Jean-Pierre Papin to understand how wide was his team. Yes, it's interesting because uh, if you say that he decided at the beginning who will be the starting 11, and we say that they change really, really few. Remember, they, they take six defenders, six midfielders, and uh, only five, uh, only four uh, strikers with Uwe Reinders, practice with only one match before. They say it was because uh, it was taken to Spain because if uh, Klaus Fischer, Oz Rubesh or Karen Rumenge had an injury, he could play. But viewing this team, uh, analyzing this team is interesting that uh, we have uh, only one player with more than 32 years. It uh, was about uh, Frank uh, was the uh, was the reserve a goalkeeper, and uh, they have uh, not a young team, but not a old team. And we have also Klaus Fischer with uh, 33, but uh, we have a middle-aged team with average, with, uh, C- with 25, 26, 28. Uh, it's maybe, remember that after the World Cup in Germany, West Germany, and after the World Cup in Argentina, they have to change some players because some Players retired and some players, some players uh, were not uh, at the level to play for national team. West Germany would have a wake-up call in their first match on June 16th versus Algeria at Gijon's Stadio El Molinion. Derval had anticipated a victory and had declared that if we don't beat Algeria, I'll take the next train home. So, for this match, you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, 
Hans Peter Briggle, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magath. He'd be replaced by Klaus Fischer in the 83rd minute, Pierre Litbarski, Horst Trubesch, and Karl Heinz Rummenigge. Algeria would win this match 2 1. Rabah Majer will open the scoring in the 52nd minute. We all remember him for the backhill goal against Bayern Munich in the 87 Champions Cup. Karhans Rummenigge would tie the match in the 67th minute. With two minutes remaining, Lakhdar Bloomy would score Algeria's winner and open the World Cup with an upset against West Germany. Already the pressure was on, on the West Germany, who had they, to win. They had to win because when they see the, the fixtures, they say that uh, if you say that uh, maybe the most difficult match was the third war against Austria. But after that defeat, everything became even, even more complicated because they didn't expect that Algeria played such football. They played well with a speed football with many talented, skilled players. Uh, Algeria was really a difficult team to face for everyone, even because they had uh, players like Majer and uh, also with, uh, not also with uh, Bellumi, but they have a really, really a good team. And they, they were upset because uh, they were not, they didn't think that, as uh, Durval said, if you don't um, beat them, we can come back home. And that maybe is one of the most important defeats in the history of German football because they lost against a team who was a good team, but really, really worse than theirs. But if you see the match, no one can say anything about Algeria win because uh, Algeria played well, played better than Germany. And even Germany had great players like Rummenigge, you can say Breitner, they were not able to challenge the Algerian team. And uh, they won, uh, they deserve the win. And that's uh, maybe that's the problem, not only losing, but deserving to lose. Because in that moment, Germany deserved to lose. And that's they say, they say that if you play like this against a team who was really, really was worse than ours, that we have a problem, and that's uh, that's uh, maybe the, the the first the first days was so difficult because Yop Durval was targeted by newspapers, by everyone saying that it was impossible that German with that kind of player they lose to they lose by uh, Algeria. Four days later, again at Gijon at Estadio El Molinon, they would face Chile. So for this match, you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kalt, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner. He'd be replaced by Lothar Matthäus in the 61st minute. This was his World Cup debut. Felix Magath, Pierre Litbarski. He'd be replaced by Uwe Reinders in the 79th minute, who would score right after coming on. Horst Rubesch and Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. For this match, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge would score a hat-trick. He'd score in the ninth minute, 57th minute, and the 66th minute. And Uwe Reinders would score in the 81st minute, just after coming on. And Gustavo Moscoso would pull a goal back for Chile right at the end to give West Germany a 4-1 win. That's interesting that after that match, it seems everything changed. They say that, okay, it was a wrong game against Algeria. We could, we could play and we could win. We could go on and we could go through, not through the end, but we can do well in this World Cup. Remember that Chile was without Carlos Castelli, who played also in 1974. In West Germany, uh, Carlos Kassel is remembered not only for his football skills, but also for his uh, political ideas and, and his uh, activism against Augusto Pinochet dictator that in that moment was uh, in the, the dictator of uh, Augusto Pinochet ended at the end of the 80s. That's interesting that in that match, Germany not all win, but convinced the audience because they played well, 
uh, they played without any problem. They managed to, they, they are able to manage the, the, the match. And uh, they say that, okay, maybe it was only a bad day against uh, Chile. But in the third one, uh, in the third match, we have something that uh, maybe had uh, changed uh, also the perspective uh, of German football. German football has an idea like the English football. We have also the fair play. And uh, now with, uh, against, uh, against Austria, we have something that has never happened before and never have been happened after in the history of German football. So we come to this infamous match against Austria, the so-called Anschluss match at Oviedo, with West Germany facing off against Austria. For this match, we have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, Hans-Peter Brigel, Wolfgang Gremler, Paul Breitner, Felix Magat, Pierre Litbarski, Horst Trubesch, he'd be replaced by Klaus Fischer in the 69th minute, and Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, he'd be replaced by Lothar Matthäus in the 66th minute. Going through the Austria lineup managed by George Schmidt, you have Friedrich Consili of Austria Vienne, Bernd Kraus of Rapid Vienne, captain of the side Eric Obermeier of Austria Vienne, Bruno Petzai of Eintracht Frankfurt in West Germany, Joseph de Georgi of Admira Wacker, Roland Hattenberger of Wacker Innsbruck, Herbert Prohaska of Inter in Italy, Reinhold Hintermeyer of Nuremberg in West Germany, Walter Schachner of Cesena in Italy, Hans Sikrankel of Rapid Vienna, and Heribert Weber of Rapid Vienna. One of the most talked about matches in the history of football, Austria, West Germany, and Algeria were fighting for the two spots to go through to the next round. It is believed that the two German-speaking nations have decided to arrange the match so that both teams would go through with a 1-0 win for West Germany. Horst yes. Rubesch scored in the 10th minute. After that goal at the beginning, uh, if you say the match, we not say that it could be sure I make an example. Paul Brighton was on the field after many years uh, when they asked them if they arranged the match. They say, of course. No, that's, that's, this attitude was not, our, was not the, the consequence of uh, an agreement between the team. Okay, we, uh, we were quiet. We are able to say that if, you will, if Germany win 1-0, that's the two teams advance to the next team. What is important because it's like uh, when you say about in Argentina 1978, about the, the match between Argentina and Peru with 6-0. Everyone can say anything because the only people who know the, oh, the truth where well, we are there on the place. And of course, they didn't say that. Remember that many, some players of that team played in Bundesliga and they know each other. They had played against... Uh, Many times. What is interesting that in uh, Ebrard Staniek was the IRD the commentator, the, the, the channel, the national channel of Germany, was ashamed. And uh, also Robert Seeger or Robert Seeger was the Austrian commentator, say that was really, really a shame. And in the second half, the neutral audience. With uh, I, I I don't know is in English, uh, Tuchern is in German, but I don't remember with, the, with white papers, not not papers, white. Uh, I don't remember the name. Yes. In a yes, and uh, they anyone say that uh, was a shame because uh, we are not say we are not say at the beginning that uh, the final matches of the group stages were played in different hours, not at the same time, like nowadays. And Germany and Austria knows how was the result of Chile against Algeria. Knowing it, they, they know how, how were the rules. And they say, okay, if we will win 1-0, uh, we go, we advance, 
without any problem. And that was the result. We don't know if it's uh, something, uh, something casual, something, but if you think uh, that, uh, no, I don't say that's normal in football. But uh, I have, I've, so, I've seen many matches in the last uh, days of uh, Italian Serie A that we say no, not was arranged, but uh, sometimes they play not one against another, but uh, uh, one with another. And, that's, uh, that's, and it was quite normal. By the way, this was Horst Rubesch's first international goal in 18 months. As far as Jupe Derval himself, he dismissed the claims of collusion and said that the teams would have been crazy to play in any other way since advancing to the second round was all that mattered. West Germany and Austria advanced to the second round. In the second round, West Germany were grouped with England and host Spain at Madrid. For the first match in this second round group, West Germany faced England on June 29th at Madrid, at Santiago Bernabeu. For this match, Rubesh was missing through injury and also Derval chose not to play Litbarski. We have the following squad. Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilike, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Bernd Forster, Hansi Müller, he replaced by Klaus Fischer in the 74th minute, Uwe Reinders, he replaced by Pierre Litbarski in the 63rd minute, and Karl Heinz Rummenigge. And quickly going through the England lineup managed by Ron Greenwood, we have Peter Shilton of Nottingham Forest, captain of the side Mick Mills of Ipswich Town, Kenny Sansom of Arsenal, Phil Thompson of Liverpool. Terry Butcher of Ipswich Town, Brian Robson of Manchester United, Steve Copel of Manchester United, Graham Ricks of Arsenal, Ray Wilkins of Manchester United, Paul Mariner of Ipswich Town, Trevor Francis of Manchester City, and he replaced by Tony Woodcock of Colm in West Germany in the 78th minute. This match would end as a scoreless tie somewhat of a dull match that nearly came to life five minutes from the end when Karl-Heinz Rummenigge's long-range shot hit the bar and bounced back. Otherwise, it was a hard-fought scoreless tie. Yes, was I, I think was I saw that match because that World Cup for us Italian is, is special because we won, but uh, because we won in a such way, maybe expressing our best football. In uh, I don't say now our history, in the post war, simply was a really a hard fight battle. We say many kicks, uh, so a uh, few football. But remember that uh, that uh, idea that after the first uh, group uh, we have two mini groups of three teams, uh, and remember that we have no the three points for win, but two points for win. We say that it could be better to take one point that. Uh, to lost uh, and uh, we take uh, nil and uh, maybe also i i know that the one i think there was not an annoying a boring match but remember it was uh, without any show time we see uh, really two teams we are not uh, we didn't want to lose even more than they didn't want to win they want to win because they were were really feared and Germany, after the match against Austria, remember that around the team, was, there was not a good, uh, we say, in an atmosphere. We are not a good atmosphere in German team after, around German team, not in German team, after that match against Austria. That's right. I think both teams were very cautious in this game and cancelled each other out. I think both teams were looking to the game against Spain to uh, to get the win and, and go through. It wasn't a great game. It wasn't a memorable game, this one. I, there, were, there weren't many clear chances in this game at all. In England were also criticised for a negative approach in this game. Uh, Bobby Robson and Don Howe, who was assisting him, I think they, Don Howe more or less openly said that their main objective was to uh, 
to stop the Germans really and and England didn't didn't show very much creative intent in this game at all. Uh, as, as I say, both teams seem to be looking to the game against Spain to to get a win and go through. And as Roberto says, it was partly due to the format as well at this time of having this mini group stage after the initial group stage that sometimes it worked and you got you, you got great games, but often, particularly I think the first game was very cautious that teams were just trying not to lose. And this was one of them. On July 2nd at uh, Madrid, at, at the Bernabeu, the World Cup host Spain hosted West Germany. For this match, you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, Hans-Peter Briegel, Wolfgang Gremler, Paul Breitner, Bernd Forster, Klaus Fischer, Pierre Litbarski, captain of the side Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, who would be replaced by Uwe Reinders, in the second half. And quickly going through the Spain lineup managed by Jose Santa Maria, you have Luis Arconada, captain of the side from Real Sociedad, Jose Camacho of Real Madrid, Miguel Tendio of Valencia, Santiago Urquiaga of Athletic Bilbao, Jose Alessanco of Barcelona, Rafael Gordillo of Betis, Perico Alonso of Real Sociedad, Jesus Zamora of Real Sociedad, Juanito of Real Madrid, who'd be replaced by Lopez Ufarte of Real Sociedad in the 46th minute, Kini of Barcelona, he'd be replaced by Jose Sanchez of Barcelona in the 65th minute, and Carlos Santiana of Real Madrid. West Germany would take the lead in the second half in the 60th minute through Pierre Litbarski. Pierre Litbarski himself would provide the assist for Klaus Fischer in the 75th minute. And Spain would score a consolation goal through Jesus Zamora in the 82nd minute. And this result, coupled with the scoreless tie between Spain and England a few days later, would help West Germany advance to the semifinals. So, and let's we say that uh, that's the turning point of uh, German uh, of German uh, tournament because they won in a difficult atmosphere. Remember that the, the Santiago Bernabeu, as any as uh, many players said, 19 minutes in Santiago Bernabeu could be so so long, but uh, Germany played a solid match, trying to manage it and winning. Uh, to nil, but uh, they didn't suffer. They didn't suffer a lot. Uh, they, they didn't suffer a lot, and maybe without this match, maybe it could be not be possible the the comeback in the following match against France in the semi final. So we come to the semi final in question on July eighth at Seville, with West Germany facing France in one of the greatest games of the history of football and of course one of the most controversial one of the most talked about matches so many incidents in this match just to give an indication France captain Michel Platini he once said that he went through every conceivable emotion during this match so which I'm sure was shared by everyone on both sides uh, he asked uh, Shan said also that he have never uh, after the Batistan accident like, against Aral Schumacher, he said that he didn't say the end of the match. For him, the match finished third one for France because uh, that after years uh, he have never saw again that match on TV. When they broadcast on TV, they, they change channel. For this match, Rumenige did not start as he was, he had a slight injury. So you have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, captaining in Rummenigge's absence, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, Hans-Peter Brigel. He replaced by Karl-Heinz Rummenigge in the 96th minute, Bernd Forster, Wolfgang Dremler, Paul Breitner, Pierre Litbarski, Felix Magat. He replaced by Horst Hubesch in the 72nd minute. 
and Klaus Fischer. And going through the France lineup managed by Michel Hidalgo, you have Jean-Luc Ettori of Monaco, Maxim Bossis of Nantes, Manuel Amoros of Monaco, Gérard Janvion of Saint-Étienne, Marius Trezor of Bordeaux, Jean Tigana of Bordeaux, Bernard Gengini of Sochaux, he replaced by Patrick Battiston of Saint-Étienne in the 52nd minute, who, as we spoke, would be replaced in turn by Christian Lopez of Saint-Étienne in the 62nd minute after he was knocked out by Harold Schumacher. We will get to that incident. Alain Gires of Bordeaux, Kapner beside Michel Platini of Saint-Étienne, Dominique Rochteau of Paris Saint-Germain, and Didier Six of Stuttgart in West Germany. Pierre Litbarski gave West Germany the lead in the 17th minute, and Michel Platini tied the match with a penalty kick in the 26th minute. Obviously, the most talking point of this match was when Patrick Battistone was sent clear by Platini and only had Harald Schumacher to beat. As he lobbed his attempt, Harald Schumacher just collided with him and knocked him unconscious, and Battistone lost a couple of teeth. He was stretchered off. Incidentally, it's one of the strangest decisions in any World Cup that the referee actually gave a goal kick to West Germany and didn't even whistle for a foul because yeah. uh, his uh, yeah. Batista's yeah. attempt had gone wide. Now it could be uncountable. I think that yeah, it could now it could be penalty and red card. Yes, that's that w- was sure. That is interesting that Ara Schumacher, when anyone asks it, ask about that moment, he said that uh, if you see the what happens on the field after the collision, when uh, uh, the, the French doctors comes to the comes to the field, we say that uh, we see that Ara Schumacher is completely uninterested of what is happening to Batistone. Uh, he said that we, he was not uninterested. He was afraid of uh, French players' reaction. He did anything because uh, he was afraid that if he face them, they beat them, and they could be. It could be possible. It is interesting that uh, he say he had also say that he had never done it with uh, intention. It yes. was an incident. They say that, was, uh, in my opinion, was he said that he didn't want to take them and uh, to injure them. But it's interesting that in the match, it was a turning point because the German team then was the, not the only team on the field, but uh, they tried to tie it at, at the end. They go, go to the penalties. Getting back to Schumacher, I think some of the animosity is also like, after the match, a journalist had notified Schumacher that uh, Batistone had lost a few teeth in the incident. And Schumacher was quoted as saying that if that's all that's wrong with him, I'm prepared to pay what it costs to have them crowned. Again, he says that he had no malice, but that he had been fearful that Batistone had suffered an even graver injury and he was grateful that he had not. But that's always part of the background to the history of this match. But getting back to the match, like you said, it went to overtime. That's when the match came to life in terms of scoring. Just two minutes into the overtime, Marius Trezor scored a beautiful volley from a cross, from a free kick by Alan Gires. And uh, in the 98th minute, Jures himself scored the third goal for France. And at this point, it seemed like France were cruising to victory. Derval had sent Rummenigge on around the 96th minute. And Rummenigge would pull the goal back in the 102nd minute. In the 108th minute, 
Klaus Fischer scored with a beautiful overhead kick to make the match a 3-3 tie. The match went to penalty kick shootout. We all know we saw Uli Schilke missed his kick and started crying. And immediately, DDS6 also missed his attempt. And eventually, Maxim Bosis would miss his attempt as well. And Hrubesh would score West Germany's last attempt. And West Germany was through to the final. And this was the first ever penalty kick shootout in World Cup history as well. Yes, it was the, it was the most controversial man on the field. Schumacher was the, dec- the decisive one because if Germany won, it was also thanks to his, uh, his performance in the penalties. In the, the day before, of course, uh, no one think about this. It, in France, for example, I think that they keep uh, right uh, like uh, Nazis, uh, SS, uh, something about uh, the, the episode of the injury. And, uh, but uh, after the match, Paul Breitner, when they came back to the hotel, they were not so confident that in the final they could uh, beat Italy. Because, of course, Italy had an easier match against Poland. Remember that in Poland they play maybe with every neutral fan with Italy. And we have the, for example, Poland, we have uh, Boniak who could play for, uh, for Italy. And uh, also now, now he lives between Italy and, uh, Ge- Italy and Poland. But remember that the Germans were not so confident about the final because uh, we saw that uh, Italy was uh, in another uh, was in an increasing moment because after the first three matches when Italy won only by different go through only by difference goal uh, by goal difference at the and the second part against Argentina against Brazil they dominated not only they win and then they have the final in uh, in uh, in Madrid this win against France had come at a price not only the exhaustion after going to overtime, but the crowd was decidedly against West Germany after what they had perceived to be an injustice uh, for what happened to Battistone, etc. Italy were favored. And also, let's not forget that as the World Cup had progressed, Italy had been getting better and better with each, each match and were in much more confident mood at this point than West Germany, whom we should say maybe had dodged a few bullets just to get to this point. We come to this final match on July 11th at Santiago Bernabéu, Madrid, between Italy and West Germany. For West Germany, we have Harald Schumacher, Manfred Kaltz, Karl-Heinz Forster, Uli Stilicke, Hans-Peter Brigel, Bern Forster, Wolfgang Dremler. He'd be replaced by Horst Trubesch in the 63rd minute. Paul Breitner, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. He'd be replaced by Hansi Müller in the 70th minute. Pierre Litbarski and Klaus Fischer. Going to the Italy lineup managed by Enzo Bierzot. We have captain of the side, the 40-year-old Dino Zoff of Juventus. Claudio Gentile of Juventus, Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Fulvio Colovati of AC Milan, Gaetano Shirea of Juventus, Bruno Conti of Roma, Marco Tardelli of Juventus, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, Gabriel Oriali of Inter, Francesco Graziani of Fiorentina, he replaced by Alessandro Altobelli of Inter in the seventh minute after an injury who in turn would be replaced by Franco Causio of Udinese in the 89th minute. As far as the match, Italy were awarded a penalty kick in the first half that Antonio Cabrini actually missed. But the more confident Italians continued their game and they took the lead in the 57th minute to Paolo Rossi. 
Marco Tardelli scored in the 69th minute, one of the most talked about goals in World Cup final history. The cry of the schizo, as it's called. And Alessandro Altobelli scored in the 81st minute. Just a couple of minutes later, Paul Breitner pulled the goal back for West Germany. But Italy went on to win their third World Cup. This ended West Germany's season that had started brightly. But after the World Cup final, it should be said that they lost a lot of credit uh, at the end of this season, despite uh, reaching a final. Yes, because uh, I think that the final was dominated by Italy. Uh, of course, when uh, the when uh, Antonio Cabrini missed the penalty after the in the first uh, after the end of the first half, they were in the dressing room and uh, Cabrini uh, was crying because uh, he missed the penalty. And uh, Enzo Berzot was the national coach say, okay, don't worry, go on and think on playing because we have already won. Because everyone in Italy was convinced to, won, to win because the team was solid, they play a good football. Maybe I say that except uh, in the World Cup, home World Cup uh, again in Italy, we don't won, but maybe we play the best uh, football in our history. Remember that and the, the problem that Germany arrived at the final with no fool. They, they were exhausted. The, the battle in uh, Sevilla against France was really, really, not only for physically, but only mentally. Because 3-1, uh, 3-3, and then at the end, the penalty kicks. Uh, yes, I don't know how to evaluate this, this season. But of course, uh, they had the base for... Other for maybe other four years uh, because uh, maybe against except Fisher except Rubesh were too old. Uh, they have so many players that uh, and also Bratner. Uh, they play at player like Kaltz, but also first uh, also Stilke. They could play for other years. Remember that after two years they changed the after the elimination the first stage against in uh, european in uh, european championship in 1984 they changed the the manager yubdura was replaced by frank beckenbauer and uh, they after two years uh, in the following world cup they they reached the final in another way but they reached the final i remember that in that moment german football was changing and it, as every moment of changing we have uh, some uh, problems in that case for example uh, they didn't have uh, they didn't show a good football but for many years it was not a problem for german football because uh, it was a solid football a physical football but the problem was not to play well but win and uh, remember that between uh, 1962 and uh, 1980 germany won two european championship and a world cup and uh, they lost uh, some finals as far as the match, Rumenigue was ineffective and Giuseppe Bergomi marked him out of the game and he had to be substituted. And it must be said that he was carrying uh, Rumenigue, he was carrying an injury. And Stilicke publicly stated that it was a gamble to start with the half fit Rumenigue in this final. And in fact, he was very critical of. Uh, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge afterwards, he said that, that Rummenigge should have stepped forward, been honest with his injury. And according to Stilicke, West Germany played so many matches with 10 men when fit players were sitting on a bench. As far as the other players, Felix Magath did not forgive Jupp Derval for not playing him in the final. And Afterwards, he refused any selection with Jupp Derval in charge and would only make his comeback when Franz Beckenbauer convinced him to come back for the national team. Also, Stuttgart's Karl Algover was also very angry at Jupp Derval for not selecting him for the World Cup, and he also would refuse uh, any uh, call-ups from uh, Jupp Derval. There was a feeling of negativity at the end of the season for West Germany. 
which was a sharp contrast to how the season had begun with everything seemingly perfect. The World Cup really, as I said, took away a lot of their credit that they had to build up. Also, the problem is that any some also some reporters think that uh, Durval was an excellent coach, but was not able to manage some situation. And the number of disappointing player, it could be a sign, of course. It could be. But remember that in every kind, in every level, at every level, if you don't play, where does the point? Of course, remember, as we said before, that if you, are, if you don't agree with the uh, national coach, we have some place like Felix Magat in that moment, the last the, the year after, it could be the match winner in the final uh, European Cup final against Juventus. And uh, he could decide not to play. And now he's, uh, I, I don't say it's unusual, but it's not so frequent. In German football, it was quite frequent. We have some players that they didn't say, I could not play if the national team coach is anyone or anyone else. But the two years after they were so difficult, uh, and the European Cup in 1984 uh, will show uh, would show it uh, because uh, there are some problems of talents, but also some problems with uh, with the coach. Who one is one of the most important coaches in the history of German football, but uh, like Ernst Westweiler or uh, or like other uh, Linus Michels for a uh, Dutch national team, no one could agree with them. For example, if you read some comments about Derval or about Michels, we can say something, say, oh, he's a genius. But sometimes you say, okay, he's not a genius. And uh, sometimes he makes some uh, mistakes. Yeah, Derval was very unpopular towards the end. In fact, he had wanted to resign before the 1984 Euros, but... Uh... Herman Neuberger convinced him to stay until at the end of the Euros. And remember that before he was the assistant coach of Helmut Schoen. Yes. He, anyone who won a World Cup and uh, achieved a, a one a World Cup final in uh, 1970. But uh, uh, maybe sometimes uh, it was uh, difficult because uh, there were a lot of pressure on, on him and on the German team especially after the failure of the uh, World Cup in Argentina. Uh, and uh, starting from that moment, remember that in 1980, they won a World Cup under the a European Cup under uh, Jupp Durval, uh, Jupp Durval management. We say that uh, we only, when we talk about uh, Jupp Durval, anyone mention the, the shame of Gihon, not shame that they won a European Cup. Paul, what do you think about this season? Yeah, um, um, I think unfortunately that that's true. There's no doubt that they were a, a very strong team, but it would have been an injustice, I think, if they'd won this World Cup, both the Austria match and, and the semi-final. I think, like you say, left a lot of bad feeling and um, took away a lot of the, the, the credit that that team might otherwise have had. And I mean, we, we, we should also say, you know, that that was, uh, you know, for those of us that were around, it was, it was an incredible World Cup to watch. And I think maybe two of the greatest games in World Cup history that we, that we got to see Brazil and Italy, but also that semi final was such a dramatic game. So many things happened in it. And then the first penalty shootout, it really has. You know, gone down in history rightly as 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 a great game, uh, one that everyone who saw it will will always remember. But as a team, that they were a, a very strong team and a, and a functional team. That I think, as as Roberto said, there was no real flair in in this team. That maybe Schuster would have added to it, very physically strong, but. I don't think they would have been the, the worthiest winners of, of, of this World Cup, although they were undoubtedly still you know, one of the strongest teams in Europe at the time and would continue to be strong for a long time. The basis of that many of these players would continue at least until 1986. And the 
continuity was very impressive of, of German football, that they'd keep qualifying and performing well in tournaments as a rule for a long time. But I don't think this team, probably because of those two matches, would, would be regarded as very fondly and regarded as one of the, the greatest German teams anyway. Any final thoughts, Roberto, for this season? I think that, as you say, that it was uh, one of the most strange World Cup for Germany. That period was quite difficult to understand because we have, after maybe that moment, was uh, one of the, the Argentinian World Cup was uh, the one of the, the greatest failure in German World Cups. But as, you, as we said before, uh, from that moment, they started to rebuild. But uh, it was not a complete rebuilding <clears throat> because we have uh, some players of the old guard, like Breitner. But uh, they, I think that the, these four years were, were more important than we think because in that moment, we started from one of the most difficult moments. But uh, I remember that after that difficult moment, we have, one, if you make only the major tournaments, uh, European Championship won uh, in 1892 uh, final. They were eliminated in the first stage in 1984. In 1986, they reached a final. 1888, in the European Cup, they reached the semifinal. And in the 1990, they won. We say that the results were not so bad and the level of Bundesliga during the 80s increased. Of course, uh, not uh, being like Syria in that moment or uh, like uh, the first division in England, but uh, we have a great uh, improvement also in the national team, also because many players went to play in the 80s outside. Remember that in Italy, we have uh, Inter Milan with three, with Matteo Spreme and uh, Klinsmann. We have uh, Anzi Miller, we played also in Inter, but we have uh, Inter Milan, we have many others. Remember that, that years, those years were important, but a, a bit underrated. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. Brambia for his participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. For any questions and comments, you may contact me on my blog and on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at sp1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on Twitter at 1888letter and his blog is the1888letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Brambia can be contacted on Twitter at Bobby Brambo. And I've also included the link of his blog, Lango Lodi Fritz Walter. Dot wordpress.com and also link to his book. I've also included the link to Mr. Paul Will's book before the Premier League, a history of the football league's last decades. Again, all this information is on the blog and Spotify listing. So thank you, Roberto. And thank you, Sham. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sham. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.